Welcome everybody. My name is Sarah Backrack and I'm part of the Northampton Neighbors Speakers Committee. And thanks for coming to this is our second Zoom speakers. Um, just a short blip, Northampton Neighbors has 900 members. And even during the time of the COVID pandemic, we're still trying to provide calls to people who would like weekly check-ins um, and some Zoom activities. We're just beginning to start to open up for some services, but mainly outside, yard work, raking leaves, planting flowers. Um, so during this time, we have to improvise. Just to introduce the logistics, Nina talked about some, everyone will be muted. If you have a question to ask at any time, you can ask it via the chat button. The chat button is at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have a problem, I don't know how to help you because that's all I know. <laughs> Nina can talk if she has something to add. Uh, um, people are having problems, they can send me a message in the chat window. How do they find the chat window if they can't find that? Uh, they wiggle their mouse or oh, their trackpad, the and then it's at the bottom of the screen. Okay, it so says it's always chat. at the bottom, and it says chat. So please ask your questions and we'll try to get to all of them. Um, everyone will remain muted though, and we're only going to take questions via the chat because when too many people get on, we can't find hands and it gets too noisy. Um, and, and I'll try to get to all your questions. So let me introduce Ellie Maripol. Um, she's the author of four novels, her sister's tattoo that she's going to read from today, Kinship of Clover on Hurricane Island, House Arrest, and many essays of which a few are published in Little Lit Hub, Lilith, Ms. Magazine, Mom Egg Review, Boston Globe, and the Writer's Chronicle. She's also a founding member of Straw Dog Writers Guild and leads the social justice writing project of the Guild. And that's only her last, her newest iteration of herself in her profession, and she may tell you more. I'll turn it over to Ellie now. Thank you for coming, Ellie. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and thank you, Northampton Neighbors, for being here. 21 years ago, I was working as a nurse practitioner in Springfield. I loved my job, life was good, but I had always wanted to write novels. I read a lot and sometimes I would finish a book and I would think maybe I could do that. And sometimes I would finish a book and I would think, oh, I wish I had written that book. In the year 2000, I decided to start writing fiction. I was in my mid fifties and I had no clue how to start. I had never taken a creative writing class. I just, I just really didn't know. So I found an ad in the back of an American Airlines uh, magazine on a plane and I signed up for an online workshop. I figured if I really sucked, then nobody would know. And so that was a safe way of trying it. I absolutely loved it and I kept writing stories. For me, writing fiction is this mysterious and magical stew of memories, dreams, experiences, imagination. My novels all start with a spark, some small thing, a character, a set of eyebrows I see on a bus, a what if, and I never know where I'm going. I never outline. Kurt Vonnegut once said, the way to write a novel is to jump off a cliff and to develop wings on the way down. And that's the way it feels to me. It is exhilarating, it's exciting, it's frightening, um, and it's often surprising. That's one of the things I like best is that my characters often will surprise me. So one of the first stories I wrote was about two 12 year old girls who meet at summer camp and they discover that their mothers are sisters. 
They didn't know this. They didn't know each other. Their mothers haven't spoken to each other in a dozen years because of something that happened at an anti-Vietnam War protest. Well, I learned two things from writing that short story. First of all, I learned that it didn't want to be a short story. It wanted to be a novel. It was too complicated. It was too big. It was too important to me to be contained in 25 or 30 pages. So I kept writing and I wrote a novel draft about these two girls and their mothers who were sisters. I found a local writing group. Some of you might know or even have written with Writers in Progress, Dory Oster Miller's group based in Florence. Um, and I revised, but that taught me the second thing, which was I really didn't know how to write a novel. So I enrolled in a low residency MFA program, a Master of Fine Arts in Fiction, and I learned some craft and I graduated from the program and I published three other novels. And every time I sent a manuscript off to my editor, I would return to those sisters and their daughters. I would write another draft or two. I couldn't get it right, but I couldn't let it go. So there are a few reasons for that, I think. One is that, as I said before, it's kind of a big story. It covers 35 years, three generations. It goes from the shtetls of Eastern Europe to the streets of the United States. It's told from multiple points of view. And it asks some big questions about moral issues. So I really wanted to keep digging and to get it right. I think the second reason is that while the characters are made up and the story is made up, a lot of the context of the novel comes from family stories that I learned as a child and from my own lived experience as an activist. The third is, I think, a reason common to a lot of people who start writing um, or maybe start any kind of artistic endeavor later in life. Um, I call myself a literary late bloomer. And that is that if you've been reading and thinking about literature for decades, your critical skills and your taste are simply a lot more developed than your skill as a writer. At least that was true for me. The other true thing was that although people warned me that starting something new would be difficult because I would be a beginner, I loved being a beginner. I loved feeling that I had nothing to prove, that I could try things and I could fail, and that was just fine. So it worked for me. So 20 years later, her sister's tattoo was finally published. Because it begins in 1968, over 50 years ago, it's classified as historical fiction but really it could be set today, given the massive protests and the really difficult choices that people are being called to make. Now though, I invite you to close your eyes and enter the world of her sister's tattoo with me. It's a hot August day, 1968. You are marching down the streets of downtown Detroit, protesting the war in Vietnam with thousands of other people, black and white, young and old. In the front of the march, you see Rosa and Esther. You know them a little from the anti-war movement, from women's liberation. You've heard that they come from a family of activists, their parents, their grandparents, for years, you've seen them at demonstrations, union rallies and civil rights demonstrations. You've been in meetings with one or both of the sisters. This is what you 
and Rosa and Esther see on that march. The August air was charged with whiffs of marijuana and patchouli oil, the sulfur stench of asphalt softening in the heat, and the distant admonition of gas. Protesters overflowed the broad expanse of Woodward Avenue and spilled onto the sidewalk. Their chants ricocheted off the brick faces of the squat downtown Detroit buildings. And the excitement, excitement had a peppery smell all its own. Well, when the march arrives at the rally site, you lose sight of the sisters. You're not near them when they hear the rumor that cops are beating people a few blocks away. You don't see them leave the rally to go help, to try to stop the violence. But later, you hear what happened on Grand River Avenue. You hear that the mounted police were beating people. You hear that the sisters threw small, hard green apples at the cops to try to make them stop hurting people. You hear that an officer was hit and he's hurt. You wonder what you would have done if you were with Rosa and Esther on Grand River Avenue. The next scene I'm gonna read takes place right after the demonstration. Rosa and Esther return to Esther's apartment so she can nurse her baby, Molly and to watch the evening news. A young anchorman with outsized ears orchestrated the network coverage of the demonstration. Film clips of speeches alternated with live feed of confrontations between demonstrators and police. Protesters thrust peace signs out the half open windows of the jail bound buses. We shouldn't have split early. Rosa imagined herself leading chants from the front of the bus, talking to reporters, convincing ordinary citizens watching TV that the war was wrong. She missed the electric charge, the wonderful chaos. I'm glad we did, Esther said. What if we'd been busted? Rosa pointed to the screen, shush. Paramedics ran with a stretcher toward an ambulance. Lights flashed, blanket, an injured police officer, blanket tucked to his chin, a close-up of his helmet hooked on the IV pole, bumping up against the saline bottle. Someone led a horse away. The reporter stood to the side. On Grand River Avenue, a few blocks from the rally at Kennedy Square, demonstrators attacked mounted police officers. Officer Martin Steele lost control of his mount and was thrown. The officer is in serious condition at City Hospital with a spinal cord injury. Demonstrators attacked the cops. Rosa yelled at the television screen. What about cops cracking heads? She picked up her sandwich, looked at it, then put it back down. The anchorman introduced a wire service photographer who'd been eating at a restaurant on Grand River. We bring you an exclusive interview to shed some light on the tragic consequences of today's street fight. Street fight? Rosa grabbed two fistfuls of her hair. They were beating up unarmed citizens. Did you see anyone taking photos, Esther asked, switching Molly to the other breast? Shush. I was at lunch when a skirmish developed between mounted police and demonstrators, the photographer said. I stood under the restaurant awning and took photos of the fighting. That's when I noticed two curly haired young women, a redhead and a brunette acting furtive. When they threw the rocks, my camera was ready. Furtive, Esther asked. They weren't rocks, Rosa muttered. His photograph filled Jake and Esther's television screen. Two young women with pale oval faces and electric hair, one with eyes squeezed closed. 
each with one arm extended, fingers splayed, frozen in the act of letting go. Neither sister spoke. Local coverage transitioned to international news. Soviet tanks swarmed the streets of Prague. Rosa felt dizzy. Esther turned to her sister and touched her arm. It's worse than I thought, she whispered. What have we done? Well, that evening, the sisters are both arrested. They're charged with multiple serious felonies. Rosa wants a political trial. She sees it as another way to protest an unacceptable war. But Esther has a five-month-old daughter. And one of those campers, by the way, I mentioned before. We'll come back to Molly. And she wants to stay out of prison. So Esther reluctantly accepts a plea bargain offer which means that she must testify against her sister. And that sibling conflict is the other reason this, took, this book took 20 years to complete. That issue is really close to home for me, close to my family legacy. My husband, Robbie, is the younger son of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, who were executed in 1953 for conspiracy to commit espionage. Robbie was six years old. The only trial testimony against his mother, against Ethel, came from her beloved younger brother, David Greenglass. David's testimony sent his sister to her death. Decades later, David Greenglass admitted on national television that he had lied, that he perjured himself. I've always been pretty obsessed with that sibling relationship. Ethel and David, Duvi, as she called him, were so close. How could he betray her? I've never wanted to write a novel about the Rosenberg case, and I didn't. That's not what this book is about. But I did want to explore the question of one sibling testifying against another. I was interested in how characters who grew up together, who loved each other, once they were involved with courts and the so-called justice system, how they could be faced with impossible choices, choices between loyalty to family, allegiance to the truth as they see it, and their deep commitment to social justice. The next excerpt I'd like to read for you is um, one that takes place at Rose's trial. Um, Esther is in the witness box. Rosa sat at the defense table between her lawyers, refusing to look in the direction of the witness box. Good thing, because Esther didn't think she could hold her face intact if their eyes met. Rosa's lawyer must have given her the same speech about how dressing conventionally in court made a good impression on the jury. Rosa wore a white blouse under a loose blue cotton jumper her hair was gathered in a matching ribbon, and she had attached a gold circle pin to the rounded Peter Pan collar. Esther stifled a smile. If the jury had x-ray vision, if they could see beyond the gold-plated circle, through the blue jumper and cotton blouse, they would be shocked. Because tattooed on Rose's left breast was a small red star a quarter inch in diameter. Esther knew that tattoo well. It was the twin of hers. Getting matching tattoos had been Rose's idea two summers before when they hitchhiked to San Francisco with Maggie. At first, Esther had been appalled. Tattoos are for sailors and gang members. That's gonna change, Rosa had said. 
you'll see. These tattoos will identify us as revolutionaries, will prove our commitment to the whole world. Esther had giggled to whatever subset of the world we show our tits. Maggie had tried to reason with them about dirty instruments and infection and self-mutilation, but Esther didn't worry about pain or disease. She just wanted to capture the delicious moment and make it last. A tattoo is forever, she had thought, like a sister. Well, is a sister forever, no matter what? Rosa and Esther's choices define their lives in very different ways, and both of their choices have profound consequences. At that demonstration, Rosa was pregnant and didn't know it yet. She has a daughter. The sisters pass on very different legacies to their daughters. Rosa's daughter, Emma, grows up proud of the family legacy. She knows all about what happened on that Detroit street. But Esther's daughter, Molly, knows nothing about it. When they're 12, the girls meet at that summer camp I mentioned at the beginning. They are drawn to each other, but they have no idea they're related. After an argument about courts and justice, Emma brings Molly to the camp archive to explain her position. And I'm going to end with part of that scene from the camp archive. Um, you need to know that Molly, Esther's daughter, the one who knows nothing about her mother's activism, is the narrator in this section, and in fact, for a good part of the last third of the book. Emma has just told Molly how her mother went to prison for hurting a cop. Emma shows her a newspaper article and shows her that photograph you saw before. I studied the large black and white photograph Two young women with pale oval faces and frizzy hair were caught with their arms flung out, fingers extended as if they had just thrown something. Emma's finger pointed to the woman on the left. That's my mom, Rosa. But I stared at the other woman, the one on the right whose eyes were closed. The air in the room went all stale and dead and so heavy my lungs couldn't suck it in. What's wrong? Emma asked. I don't understand, I pointed. That looks like my mother. Esther stared at me. That's impossible. That's Esther Levin, my mom's sister, who finked on my mom and sent her to prison. Esther Levin Green. I pictured the gold letters on the diploma that hung on the wall over my mother's desk in the alcove off the kitchen. A smoldering started deep inside my throat and spread like fiery sunburn over my neck and face. Know-it-all Emma was dead wrong about this. My mother doesn't have a sister, I said. I would know. She would have told me. Emma looked at me and then at the photograph, then back at me, like she was trying to decide if I resembled my mother or maybe if I was somehow responsible. What did you mean, I asked, that Esther finked on her sister? Esther testified against my mom and sent her to prison so she could avoid prison to take care of her baby. She jabbed her finger in my face. That must be you. I didn't understand. In Emma's world, people attacked policemen and went to prison. In my world, People were regular and their kids hung out with their friends and had fun. How could we be in the same family? A moth bumped its frantic dance against the window. Emma wouldn't stop talking. My grandparents, she said, well, I guess our grandparents had to sell their shoe store to pay the fines. I covered my ears with my hands so I wouldn't have to hear her lies. My grandmother collected porcelain cocker spaniels. 
We visited her every year at Passover. She had promised to leave me her china doggies in her will. Would she leave half to Emma? No, I crossed my arms and frowned at Emma. I don't believe any of this. So Emma repeated the whole story again about cops beating people and throwing apples and the horse rearing up and the cop falling down. Except this time she told it with two sisters, Rosa and Esther. This time it was worse because I knew what was coming and her sentences punched holes in my lungs up one side and down the other. When she finished, the room was quiet except for the dull lament of a lone cricket. No way, I whispered when I had breath again. I pushed off the stool and turned away from Emma. I'm going back to the bunk. I don't want to hear anymore. I love my mom. I love mine too, Emma said softly. I squeezed my lips together thin and tight and pointed at her face like she did to me before. I don't believe a word of this, I said. You made this stuff up. Thank you. Wow. I hate to jump in with some sort of logistic stuff, but just before we go in, please remember if you have a question, go to chat so that Ellie can try to get to all of them. And also, this is just a plea for Northampton Neighbors, which is a nonprofit and still has no fees or, or costs for joining or for services. And even during this time of a pandemic, we're trying to keep supporting people and we need your support. So if you can, if you can go on the website of NorthamptonNeighbors.com, there's a donate now button and lots of ways to donate and as little as you can or as much as you can, whatever would be very helpful. So Ellie, I'm gonna start with the questions. After having this story in your mind for over 20 years, and now you finished it, do you miss it? Do you miss the background noise? Um, I don't miss it yet because I'm spending four or five times a week um, doing things just like this. So I'm still living with the sisters um, and their story. Um, I don't really know what this it'll be like when I'm I'm done um, promoting this book. Um, I suspect I'm not finished with these characters. Um, in fact, there was a section of the book, um, what we call a frame story, um, something that's at the beginning of the book and the end of the book and often referred to in between. And it was a story about the sisters in 2019 in our contemporary world. And my editor thought it was just too complicated and she had me um, take out the frame story, but in, I, I couldn't, I couldn't um, give it up. So I changed the characters' names and a few details and that story has now been published as a short story. So if you read Her Sister's Tattoo and you must know what happened to Rosa and Esther, um, years later, you can find that story at uh, online at Solstice Magazine. Another question. Why did you choose 1968? Was it significant date for any other reasons? Um, 1968 was a really important year in the anti-war and women's liberation movements. Um, you know, this, this story takes place or begins um, in one of the most intense periods of protest that our country has had. Now, I was not prescient and I didn't know the book would come out in another period that is turning out to be another very intense period of protest. Um, but I chose it because it seemed to me that's the time when this story would be most likely 
to be recognizable as something that um, many people of, of my generation were part of. So um, it just, it felt like absolutely the right year. It's also the year I got married, but that's irrelevant to uh, <laughs> writing the book and the story. Now that the story is done, have, have you learned any surprising things about your characters that you didn't expect? Um, I learned a lot of surprising things about my characters in the writing of the story. I'm not sure I have in the time since it's been published, which is um, not quite two months. Um, but I think one of the reasons why this story took me such a long time to feel like I, I got it right was that I think when I started, Rosa and Esther were um, ideas more than fully developed characters. There was the sister who was really the badass and was going to keep going no matter what. And there was the sister who was the mom and had to take other people into account. Um, I wasn't really satisfied with the characters until they felt like they were real people, until they were both complicated enough. So they didn't really stand for something, um, but in fact were fully developed real people. Now you may say they're characters, they're not real people, but trust me, to me, they are real people. Um, so it's, it just took a long time. And now, honestly, when people ask me, which they often do, which character I like better or which of the sisters I identify with more, I can honestly say I love them both. They both drive me crazy. They're both stubborn and they drive me nuts, but I really do both love and understand both of them and their choices pretty equally. That was a question someone asked. <laughs> what, who, which character was most challenging for you to develop? Well, Rosa was hardest, actually, um, of the two, because she is so intransigent. She is so, um, she is so committed that it's hard for her not to come across as a um, as really self-righteous. And there are parts of her that are self-righteous, but she's much more than that. But so for me, the challenge was to make her also human and have the reader be able to see her as a, um, a person who did have self-doubts, even though she really wasn't going to let you in and let you know those, those doubts. How many years were there between the sisters? And did they either of them have any other siblings that might have influenced them? No. Only two, the two sisters, three years apart. Um, and they, um, they were pretty close to their parents. Um, this situation pretty much destroyed their parents um, because of how difficult things were between the sisters. But nobody else to get between them to, to help it out. You made an interesting point just in, in your talking that it was the Vietnam War, it was a time of, and now we're in a different kind of war and we're older. Do you think that your book can give all of us a, well, I'll speak for the question, uh, many people feel a dilemma on do they give up social distancing and join the effort because you want to, but we're of an age where we are the at-risk category. Does your book, do you think, help clarify a direction that someone could go in, in this day and age? 
You know, I think that fiction is better at asking questions than at answering them. Um, and I think that one thing the book does sort of suggest to readers is that there is not one right way. Um, there's not one decision that is going to be perfect for everybody. Um, the sisters both managed to still be, in, in my opinion, good people, although they do things differently and their ways of working for social justice turn out to be quite different. Um, and I think that's true for us today, that for each of us, no matter what our age or other category, we have to figure out how we're gonna be part of the solution rather than part of the problem and do our best to work hard in that way that feels right for us. I don't see any more questions, or I see one more, but many people commented on just, wow, and what a wonderful talk, and they need to read the book. And some who read the book thought it was tremendous. So the next and last question we have, unless someone jumps in, is where can they get the book? <laughs> well, my <laughs> reference is that you get the book from your favorite um, indie bookstore. Um, you can get the book at Broadside. You can get it at Odyssey. Um, you can get it at Book Moon in East Hampton. It's available at Amherst Books. And if you, uh, and most of those places are saying now that you get a quicker delivery if you phone in rather than use the website. I think all of those books, all of those bookstores have copies physically in the store. And so you can get it pretty quickly using curbside pickup or um, delivery. If you don't want to order from a bookstore, there's now this wonderful alternative um, online shopping place for books called bookshop.org. Um, it's an alternative to you know who, and you can get um, books from them. They share the prop, they first of all, they discount books, not as much as the other place, but they also share profits with the bookstores. So bookshop.org is another great alternative to know about for this book or for any books that you want to order um, at this time. Nina, I don't know if you want to unmic people, but we have 35 people or 34, someone just left. But Thank you so much, Ellie. That was just wonderful. And I think I speak for everybody and we'll have thank you, clapping. Yeah. Everyone can unmute themselves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Way to go. Yay. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much for, for coming, people. <laughs> wonderful. Questions? Anything Any else? Any other questions? Try to raise a physical hand. Yeah, I, your, your computer says David, but you don't look like a David. I can't, can't hear you. Marsha. Unmute, Marsha. No, okay. she's unmuted. unmuted. It's a microphone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry, this is a different computer. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. So you're not the first author to say this, but I'm totally fascinated with the idea of characters just becoming characters in their own right, that the characters actually surprised you at times. Yeah. But can you describe more about that? It's, it's, it's hard for me to understand how that happens. I think it's, it's really, it's about the writing process. It's about, um, for many writers, when we write fiction, we go sort of into what, what a friend of mine calls the zone, where you're kind of just open to the universe, you're open to your characters, you've spent so much time with these characters, they feel re real to you. And so sometimes when you don't really know what's coming next, um, I'll do something like ask my a character, 
question. And I'll say, um, tell me something you've never told me before. And then I'll just start typing. I'll start writing and see what happens. So it's really, you know, I think some writers are very um, cerebral. I'm not. I'm a sort of by the seat of the pants trying to dig down into these characters and understand them. And yeah, they do surprise me. Sometimes they'll say things that I had no clue. You know, about halfway through the process of writing this book, I learned that the husband of one of the characters used to have the hots for his for this her sister and i was shocked because <laughs> I was and it, it, it didn't become a big part of the story but it became <laughs> something that i said oh well yeah that's that's interesting. so i don't know how to explain it better than that other than if you if you love writing fiction and you love sort of making stuff up, um, this is something that happens. Now I have a long history of making stuff up. And when I was, when I was, I didn't start writing fiction until I was in my fifties, but when I was a kid, I had an imaginary friend as many of us do. And she always lived up in that corner of any room I was in. And her name was Mrs. Calipigi and Kinnikini. Mm -hmm. Idea where that came from, but you know, some of us have overactive imaginations, and so writing fiction is better than telling lies, right? <laughs> Any other questions? I do. Great, um, Mary Lynn. I'm curious, your did your experience add to the story? experiences you might have had in protesting or where the girls grew up, where the protests were, you know, what were the local regulations like? Was mm -hmm. that researched for a particular location or is it an area you were familiar with? Um, both, actually. I was very involved in anti-war and women's liberation movements in the late 60s and, and 70s. And so, I mean, I was, the, the demonstrations come partly from my own memories of what things were like and partly from research. So, you know, I went back and looked at videos and read reports of all of those anti-war demonstrations. I found speeches. Um, I, I, research the chance that we I uh -huh. been good enough to remember all of that but I remembered a lot of it and then I used research um, for the rest one of the research um, one of the places that was the most interesting to me for research was the proceedings of the winter soldier project um, you know these were Vietnam vets who came back and and testified about what they had seen what they had been through in vietnam um, the sisters have a cousin danny who goes to to fight and so and i don't have that experience so i used a lot of the winter soldier material to try to get danny's portions right mm -hmm. uh, so it was really a combination of okay. uh, experience and research. And some of the research was um, interviewing people. You know, I had friends who, who were in prison, who visited um, people in, in prison, who um, one friend, a, a local professor who had been, who had worked with the church commission that had discovered uh, the details about COINTELPRO which you know was a government um project i guess that targeted um black panthers and and other left groups and so you know i took him out to lunch and said you know let me pick your brain about this so i think the research is important um a lot of what i got from my own experience was um 
the sensory details, what it smelled like, what it felt like, what emotions you feel when you are mm -hmm. facing a line of National Guard with um, automatic rifles, the fear. Um, mm -hmm. so both. Thank you. So you're a seat of the pants writer, only you research and do loads of edits. <laughs> well, yeah, you write, I, I write first. Um, I almost always have a first draft that's written entirely from my imagination. So I know what the story is, more or less. And then I have to go back and research to get um, the details right. So, so yes, both. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Ah, uh, yes, Naomi. So you talk, it's a wonderful, wonderful talk. I can't wait to read the book. I haven't read it yet. Um, but you talk a lot about how your experience in the 60s shaped the characters and your understanding, and not at all about how your life as a nurse practitioner might have shaped it, the intervening period in your life. Do you think there were ways that did too? No. What an interesting question. Um, you know, my experiences as a nurse practitioner um, really shaped my first novel um, a lot, which was sort of about a medical ethical um, issue. Um, I'm not sure how, how my work really shape this. Um, you know, there are several characters who are medical providers of one sort or another, and there certainly are um, medical details that I didn't have to look up because I knew. Um, but I don't really know the answer to that. It's a really interesting question, and I'll think about it, but I, I don't the answer. Thank you for, for stumping me. <laughs> right, do we leave her stumped or any <laughs> last questions? <laughs> Thanks everybody and especially thank you very much Ellie. Thank you all for being part of this. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you Sarah. And thank you, Sarah. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>